validation. I think you were leading to this earlier. It's a good question here with the business of understanding what's going on and maybe not being with you when you're consolidating and putting all this information into a lesson. Uh, what I demonstrated to you in terms of introducing the language in about a half hour's period might take an hour mm. in a standard classroom. Well, yeah. So here's my tip to you. Mm -hmm. Don't rush it. Yeah. Take your time. Yes. Have fun with it. Have moments where there's lots of humor. Moments where you personalize this. You say, oh, Muhammad, do you have a dog? No. No, you don't own a dog? <laughs> <laughs> I could say, uh, Jolene, do you own a dog? No. You ask your students, do you have dogs? Culturally speaking, this gets interesting, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Animals have a very important cultural element. You'll discover that uh, some students treat dogs very differently depending on their culture. And so there's culture that's woven into storytelling as well. Isn't that the beautiful part of storytelling? Think about how you learned your own native culture. Was it through a book all the time? No. no. I learned my culture, probably 90% of it, through friends and family telling the stories. And by living the culture. And so storytelling has that human impact. It's that reach out kind of teaching, where you have a way in which you can teach cultural elements within the context of stories. You know, just a PPR is very important for our Chinese uh, for our teachers, and uh, we need to prepare some teaching tools for our uh, for this lesson. And uh, do you think that is very important for the teachers to prepare the exact correct materials for the lesson? For example, okay, I really want to teach the student meat, but I take sausage or something to show the students. I say meat, maybe it's a, we, we will confuse the students, right? So we need to prepare, uh, we need to pay attention to this, uh, the objects we need to show the students. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I think I understand your question correctly, and um, I'm right with you with the aspect of preparation. Uh, but there's a phrase in English, you've probably heard it before, the best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, it comes out of a, a, actually a Shakespeare book. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that preparation is key but we also have to be prepared to change our plans so that they fit the situation and so that they work in the context and in the circumstances we find ourselves. So absolutely, I think it's important to prepare a lesson, know what words you want to use with your students and how it is you want to make the meaning clear for those words. Do you want to use a prop, for instance? Do you want to pantomime it and use a gesture, for example? Or would you rather Use a picture. I mean, these days you can get onto Google and you can find a picture of just about anything, right? And the pictures are free. And so I would encourage you to, in your preparations, try to use as much of the impactful, as much of the memorable stuff that you can because that helps the students to remember the material. And I often will use strange pictures when I'm introducing students to vocabulary. Uh, for instance, did you see the picture that I had up there of the people who had the electrodes on their head? It's a very memorable picture. Uh, do you mean uh, pictures on Google and uh, photos is uh, not copyrighted? You can use it? If uh, you use the Google pictures that are not the, the copywritten ones that you would pay for, you know, you can use them. I'll give you an example. Uh, I use the AP, the Associated Press yeah. photos, a lot. And I can search those and I can use them as long as I give the AP Association credit when I use them. And I have to give them credit because they have the watermark on their pictures. So it's automatic. So a lot of times you'll use pictures that automatically have the credit given. But there are free photo sites out there that you can use where you don't need to pay anything. Because we use Google and Photos, it's free for to use it. To use it, yeah. Yes. yeah. What are some of the problems that you might face while doing the TBR? That's a big question. 
It's a great one because there are pitfalls and potholes that you can run into. Um, I'll tell you what one of the biggest problems I had when I first using TPR was overmodeling. <coughs> what I mean by that is I was constantly moving. I was the one who really found myself doing most of the work. I mean, I had students that were sitting back and understanding and they were getting it, but I was looking at my students as if to say, boy, you seem awfully relaxed and I feel like I need to take a three-day break. <laughs> And so I think my biggest mistake that I made when I first used TPR was overmodeling. In other words, in those steps that I described earlier, you really only need to show the students once because somebody in the class is bound to be able to demonstrate it for the rest if they're stuck. Do you understand what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Uh, so you are not the only teacher in class. You have other students in the room who may be willing to help the other students out. So for instance, when I say sale, and I left the room once, I helped you out by having a gesture that went with it, but if a lot of the class is stuck on that word, he leaves or she leaves, sale, you can just ask a couple students to, to act it out again. And then there are other means to help the students. I mean, you can put the word up on the board, you can help, help them out by having a list that you've created, you can create a translated list, but it's a very, it's a very multifaceted question you have here. I mean, there are bound to be issues that are going to come up, problems that you'll encounter. Uh, one of the other problems that I encountered was that there's this sense that within about a week or two, the students get this idea or sense that oh, this is easy, too easy. And you may have students that begin tuning out <coughs> Because you all have flown on a plane, right? And do you ever notice that, <coughs> excuse me, when you get up to like 30,000 feet and you look out a window, it doesn't feel like you're moving much, does it? Yeah. Yeah. But you're going hundreds of miles an hour. If you went 400 miles an hour down on the ground, would it feel like you're moving? Much Absolutely. Yeah. Same speed. But what happens is when you get up to 30,000 feet altitude, there's this illusion that you're just floating. TPR will create that illusion. It'll create that illusion in students' minds that this is a piece of cake. It's easy. Maybe too easy. And you, you'll want to be careful about that because some students will begin to tune out. And then you have to ask yourself the question, well, how do I pull them back in? How do I help them? Question. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, and I think for every class, the te teachers will have some expectations before the class. He expect the students to, you know, achieve some goal. Um, but uh, I do not want to ask some question about your assessment. So for TPR, from my own understanding, if you see the students can can understand. Uh, what do you say and do the right uh, things physically? That means students have already mastered the phrases or the words. So besides those assessments, do you have another, uh, some other assessment to see why the students have already mastered the words you have already taught? Okay, yeah. I'm glad you brought actually, that up. Actually, I really actually, thought sorry. about the, uh, the testing aspect when I, was when I was preparing for this presentation. And I wasn't sure exactly how far to take the assessment piece uh, because I'm sure you're going to have a variety of different assessment goals and expectations in the different schools that you're a part. But let me give you an example of a different way you can test using TPR. The, the great thing about TPR is that you're getting immediate feedback mm -hmm. because you're seeing whether the students are following you. Yeah. Now, there's a trick to this. Students sometimes will give you the impression they're understanding what's going on because they're looking around and they're going, oh yeah, I got it. So it's somewhat again of an illusion. It is necessary to test in different ways to determine to what extent your students understand what you're teaching. So for instance, one way you could do this is you could use pictures or visuals. In fact, you could use very simple stick figure drawings. That's what I use in my classroom. 
You might have a picture of a person leaving, walking out a door, for example. Mm -hmm. And you can have four pictures, <coughs> one of the person going out the door, <coughs> another one of a house with a dog in front of it, another with a kitchen scene with a mom inside, and a fourth little picture of a girl cleaning her room. Okay? Then you can say to students, with, of those four pictures, I'm going to say four different sentences. For each of the four sentences, one, two, three, and four, I'd like for you to write the number underneath the matching picture. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you would say, sale de la cocina. That would be the picture of what? Someone leaving. The person leaving. Exactly. Uh, you might have, an, you know, one of the other pictures that would be, la hija menor recoge el dormitorio. That would be the picture back in the bedroom, the girl cleaning up a little bit, right? Okay, there's, a, there's another example of the way in which we can go about testing. And we could do a two-day workshop on testing. I mean, if that really was a, a key issue, which it will be, it'll be a, a key component to your teaching, you know, it's something that I'd be more than happy to come back and spend time with. But in the scope of what we have today, the testing thing is, it's kind of like the, the large elephant in the corner of the room that we'll wave to and we'll identify and we'll acknowledge, but you know, I don't want to spend too, too much time talking about assessment because it really it can be a, a big, big issue. Hmm. Okay. Also another question. And a moment ago when you used TPR to teach us, you know, several um, sentences and phrases, sometimes actually I cannot get the accurate <coughs> pronunciation. I just, you know, say it's just maybe uh, around it. So how can you, you know, improve the student's pronunciation? Okay, great question, yeah. Did you notice how I teased out your speech? Did you notice how I kind of coaxed you to say some Spanish? Okay, it was very gentle, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. I mean, it was very, I tried to make it very low key, very casual, uh, really very graceful. Mm -hmm. And this is how speech works in a natural setting, in a natural environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of your own native languages. Mm -hmm. Mothers and caretakers, fathers, don't demand that their kids repeat things after them, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that's not how language is learned. Mm -hmm. Because kids, when they say, I hate you, mommy, mm -hmm. are not repeating what their mom said. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a mother didn't say, repeat this, I hate you, mommy, I hate you, mommy, say that after, right? <laughs> So this business of pronunciation is improved the more intake that the students get. The longer they're exposed to that language, the better their pronunciation will be. It's pure and simple. Now, are there ways that we can fine tune that? Are there ways in which we can help them to focus on a specific sound? Sure. If we want to say, for instance, if we, if we want to focus on the ch sound, as in chi, right? Like the name chi, in Spanish we use the ch in words like cucaracha. Have you heard this word before, cucaracha? Yeah. You don't want to find a cucaracha at the embassy yeah. hotel. No. Okay. If you find a cucaracha at the embassy suites, you got to call down to the front desk. A cucaracha is is a cockroach. Okay. So one one way in which pronunciation can be achieved from a fine tuning standpoint is to come up with tongue twisters, for instance. La cucaracha come con una cuchara. La cucaracha come con una cuchara. You hear the show sound in that? Cuchara is a, a spoon. La cucaracha come con una cuchara, no con cuchillo. And try saying that fast five, five times fast, right? La cucaracha come con una cuchara, no con cuchillo. And in your native language, I'm sure you can come up with tongue twisters, which are a fun way, a productive way, a very purposeful way to fine tune that pronunciation. So what do you mean is we teachers do not always concentrate on some specific things, but teach language as a whole and let them get some, you know, improvement in a natural way and by repeating and repeating step by steps. Yeah, I that love your I love your phrase the natural way. So. Because that's the key in all this. We want to work with Mother Nature. Yeah. We want to work with the way our brains are wired. And the way our brains are wired is that we got better at pronouncing things, yeah. not necessarily by pronouncing things, mm -hmm. but by letting our ears yeah. 
acquire what's called an acuity, yeah. a real, uh, so an acoustical awareness of the, of the word. Yeah. And we got that just by exposure, uh, you know, to more and more of the word being used in, in the different contexts. And as a child, you probably had songs you sang, right? Mm -hmm. That helped your pronunciation out, I'm sure. Here's what I don't recommend. When a student at a beginning level, mm -hmm. or even at an intermediate level, begins mispronouncing things, yeah. that you put them on the spot, mm -hmm. ask that they repeat these phrases over and over and over again, mm -hmm. in, a, in an attempt to kind of pound it in. Mm -hmm. Because the brain is not wired to do that. Mm -hmm. We might be able to accomplish that task but with much stress, and guess what happens the next day? They mispronounce it again. Because they haven't had enough exposure where they've allowed the right brain to acquire that sound and to allow for that, that acoustical awareness. But it's not to say that we don't want our students speaking. We do, we definitely want them speaking. All right, how about the specific steps in I Tell Crazy Stories? The four steps to fluency, the four easy steps to doing TPR storytelling can be broken down this way. First of all, I recommend you using pictures, props, and pantomiming as, enough, as much as possible. But using PowerPoint or the computer can be excellent when it comes to using pictures. <clears throat> the research shows that if the students use manipulatives, meaning objects that they manipulate, the chances of them remembering the word will be that much greater. So, I mean, you want to teach for success, right? If you want to have the most success with students, if the item can be used as a prop, you want to use a prop. Mm -hmm. Plastic cheese, plastic bread, real cheese, <clears throat> or even a, a real food. Mm -hmm. Gestures, for sure because there's a physical element in that, right? And I have a word of caution for you. I don't recommend you fall into the trap of just gesturing everything with your students because it's easy to fall into that trap. Did you notice earlier how we were doing this for sale? Mm -hmm. We did this for tiene hambre. Mm -hmm. We did this for va. Mm -hmm. Those were links. They were only meant to be used to help you to further acquire those <coughs> language items. If you use gestures constantly, number one, the students will eventually want to throw a chair at you. And number two, the, the language may be too abstract for you to use just the gesture. For instance, feels like. I feel like eating meat. Well, how do you gesture feels like? I mean, you could do um, a gesture like that, but somebody might think that means hooray, <laughs> right? Or yippee, or I won. So there's a danger in just using gestures. I encourage you to use whatever means you can to make the meaning as clear as possible. And if gestures fits the bill, if gestures is the, is the tool to reach for, then go for it. Uh, here's another uh, magical element in the introducing step. You constantly want to keep the kids involved by asking them <coughs> questions about their lives. Mohammed doesn't have a dog. Jolene doesn't have a dog either. I don't own a dog. At my house, I don't have a dog because I'm allergic, and my oldest daughter, Natalia, is allergic to dogs. So Amanda and Dylan want a dog but we don't have a dog in our house. We have a gecko, a leopard gecko that's about 12 inches long, and we have a little neon fish. There used to be three, now there's one. That's a story. I just told you a story. It was personalized, and didn't that make complete sense to you based on what we had learned earlier with some of the animals? I made a couple gestures and you understood exactly what I just communicated to you. And the most important thing is, it had to do with us as people. <coughs>
didn't have to do with what a publisher told us somebody should care about in a book. Didn't come right out of a packaged program with pictured people that we're supposed to care a lot about. It had to do with the people we care the most about, and that is our students and us as a, as a group. So this is one of the key aspects to TPR storytelling. It's a community-based approach, not just a content-based instructional tool, but it's a community-based approach as well. It's a way to engage students in the language where it really develops a rapport, a real relationship with your students. And what more could you ask for if you can go back to your native countries in a year and know that your students want to keep in touch with you? I guarantee you this. If you teach traditionally, you just try to teach your language out of a book, fewer students will probably want to keep in touch with you than if you use a playful, right-brained, content-based instructional approach like TPR Storytelling. Because the students will remember that you care. They'll remember that you reached out to them and that you shared stories, not just about your lives, but that you connected with them, the students. Questions on the first step? <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, do you think that the uh, are support the, the skills of communication and speaking? Absolutely. Yeah, they support those skills. Since the, that the students are just imitating the teacher and uh, repeating after him. So where is communication and speaking? I'm going to use the easel for a quick second. That's a, it's a very good question. Now this is going to be tricky. You can skip through here with this. Is that, uh, you see that okay? language you're teaching in the direction going to the right. It starts with the intake or the input that we talked about. Generally speaking, what that means is it starts with things like listening activities and reading. Mm We always want our students moving through the language we teach them in the direction of Outfits. output. Outfits. Okay? So TPR and TPR Intake. storytelling fall within this model. What we're doing is we're building up the eye, mm -hmm. always moving in the direction of oh. So, what are we moving in the direction of doing all the time with our students? Speaking. Writing and speaking. And speaking. Writing. Okay, so this is a communicative approach. This model supports any kind of communicative approach. Whether you use songs, for instance, the words, the phrases, the expressions in the song, the students need to be introduced to through input, where they take in that input, what we would call intake, and where you constantly move students in the direction through your activities and tasks mm -hmm. toward their output, mm -hmm. toward them maybe singing the song eventually. Mm -hmm. But notice, do we begin with the students singing the song? Listening to the song. No. We begin with them listening to the song first, and maybe even reading the song. Okay. So I hope that this model makes sense, but the, this, this particular model uh, certainly is the, the, the principle behind any kind of a communicative approach. 
but if we, if we just uh, teach them words on, I say a word and they uh, add it and say it again. So in communication, we do not speak word by word by word, but we speak sentences, phrases, automatically and naturally. So this is what I mean. Yeah, this is, okay, now I follow you. Good. Well, this is a, a key component to the communicative approach. A communicative approach does not support single words in a grocery list kind of way where you are simply looking at a vocab list with words that are not contextualized, meaning words that do not have some sort of a basis, like a song or a story. So notice that when I introduced you to words that were going to be in the story, I, didn't, I did not introduce them word by word when I said things like leaves, eats, points to. Instead, we had a full sentence that actually communicated a real idea. Mm -hmm. Mohammed points to the stove. Mm -hmm. Todd leaves the room. Mm -hmm. Right? <coughs> and so we use them in full communicative sentences. They can be very short. The very first sentence that I spoke to you when we were doing our language lesson was stand up please. It doesn't get much shorter than that. And one of the beautiful aspects to the total physical response is that it starts small with maybe a one word phrase and eventually chains or links words together to form much longer sentences. But it's communication all the time, the entire time. It's not, uh, uh, you said, we will be back home teaching uh, in this new year, and we also want to explore the method, TPR storytelling. But, you know, in China, there are uh, over 50, um, or oh, 70, sometimes there are 70 students in one class. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you give, <laughs> give me some advice about what to consider more in order to make the method successful? Okay, that's a good question, yeah. While big classes can be an issue, uh, that's a challenge. But I'm willing to bet in a group of 70 students, there have got to be at least two or more students that are very creative, very fun, playful, almost like uh, thespian type people who are willing to act things out. And all you really need to have is two or three students on your side. You don't have to have all 70 students willing to get up, come up, act things out in front of the class and be an actor. But if you can get at least a couple students to help you out as an actor, you can have an audience of 67 other people. And then you can encourage others to get involved, obviously. But notice what happens is you have a class of 70 where all 70 are understanding the input, they're processing it as intake, and you're going to design tasks in your lesson that'll move them toward the output. So I know it can seem overwhelming when you move into a class that has that number of students. No but space to move around. Yeah, to move around. <coughs> and, and actually, back when I was working with some people in Pioneer and TPR storytelling, this issue came up. And a lot of people who were using classical TPR at the time said, you know, there's a lot of movement in the classroom. There's a lot of noise, there's, a, there's a, a lot of energy in the classroom, and after a while, there's a sense that we need to take a break from that. And most of us sat around and said, you know what, you're absolutely right. And it was at that time that we decided to incorporate gestures. Because notice that with gestures, the people can sit in their chairs and they can pantomime something that you've already introduced. And that way, it's almost like an assessment. It gives you the feedback you need as the teacher, plus it keeps them physically involved. And can you imagine looking out across a class of 70 people and seeing them do this, uh, seeing them do this, you know, seeing them do this and gesturing things out in their seats so that you know that they get it. Now, is that a pure indication that they're understanding? Not a pure one, but it is an indication. And it is an opportunity for those students who are finding themselves stuck 
to look around and to go, oh yeah, that's right, and to get further input, to get further intake, to process this even more. So don't be afraid of the big classes. In fact, I like to say the more the merrier. Yeah. The more the merrier. That's what I was thinking. In big classes, students will compete to take part in front of their fellow students. Yeah, because it becomes a community effort. You know, I've had really tough classes over the years. I've had uh, over the last maybe 10 to 15, I've taught about 20 years. The last 10 or 15 years, uh, I'd say the last five years in particular, I've had some tricky classes. Uh, because we live in a society now where we can sit back, right? Where we can take stuff in, we can get on a device, and we can get the information we need. So, you know, sometimes students feel like, hey, I don't have to lift a finger. And I think there's a danger in that, but if there's a sense that you can encourage students to be playful and to join a community effort in class, those doubting students can often become believers. And often it begins with just those two students that uh, maybe you talked to outside of class and said, you know, I really need your help with this. Could, could you give me a hand tomorrow? We're going to act some things out. I've got uh, some, some props, and we're going to be learning about preparing a meal and foods, and I really could use your help on this. And a lot of times, you'll get, in, especially in a big class, at least a couple willing volunteers. And then it's, it's just, it spreads, right? It's like wildfire. When those two students help out, and the rest of the audience, the rest of the class sees how it goes, all of a sudden you've got six more, the next day you've got eight more, and you've created that community. Again, this is a tool, and there are ways to combine it with other tools. And I'll give you a real specific example in a large class how you can uh, basically group the students. If you can imagine our group here as a class, I could take the story that I had just introduced to you about Sarah and her dog, and we could break the class into teams. And we could say, okay, I'd like for this team here to add an additional sentence to the end of the story. I'd like for this team then to draw the story, including the sentence that they added. Then I'd like for this team to act out the new story. And then I'd finally like for this team to compose at least three questions that could be asked about this new story that we've come up with. Okay, and that's a way in which you can subdivide a group and do like a, like a cake and cooperative learning type activity. And so there are ways in which you can combine different techniques and different uh, teaching tricks and tools that combine with the TPR storytelling without a doubt. Now the other question you asked seemed to be more sort of a testing question again. This, this is this testing bugaboo that's, uh, that, won't, that certainly won't die. Um, the, the one aspect to the testing that I would recommend is if at all possible, you want to try to get your hands on the tests first as the instructor because you can go about it in a backward design. By backward design, I mean you can start with the end test and work your way back to preparing the lessons, knowing what's on that test and what's expected, all the way backward to the point where you begin your instruction. And that backward design type of a, 
of a technique can be very, very helpful for you if you have a test in advance. But yeah, there are ways that you can combine the TPR story time with many other approaches. And in a high school, I strongly recommend song, dance, and raps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can use any of those things here in the United States, song, dance, and raps go over really well. I mean, you'll have students who will be bugging you to bring in their cell phones or their video cameras, and they'll want to record it. And if it's possible, have your students record one of the songs, one of the dances, one of the raps that was performed, and I guarantee you, students will go then online to want to see that again or hear it again. And guess what that is? More, more input. input. It's more input. Here, here's a way that I can draw this to help you understand this. The O is a balloon. Okay? But the balloon is inside a larger balloon. This larger balloon here is the eye. That's the input. And the output in the smaller balloon is always smaller mm -hmm. than the outer balloon. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay, so output is a product of the input. Mm -hmm. But the input is always further in advance mm -hmm. their comprehension is always much further along than their output. Yeah. And this is how language works in a natural situation, right? Step two. When you tell the story, and let me tell you folks, this is when it gets fun, you become a connector in class. You're telling a story maybe about yourself, your family, your personal life, or maybe telling a story that's either been pre-scripted, you know, already designed, like the stories in my book, or one that you have come up with based on the conversations in class that you've had with your students. Co-created stories are the most powerful because it, it again, allows for this community effort. So did, did you notice earlier how I said I could subdivide and do a cooperative learning type task? A story where you add a new sentence, and you draw it, and you as a team act it out, and later you have questions composed about that story, is a co-created story. So it's one in which, as a class, you're working together to come up with really something new, something brand new. Mm -hmm. Here's a tip for you. When you're telling the story, I didn't do this with you guys, but with your classes, you might have them gesture the story as it's being told. If, for instance, you've introduced the students to some new items and you had six or seven gestures, maybe one of them was like this, another was like this, another was like this, and you had seven of them. As you tell the story in your native language to the students, ask them to pantomime it in their seats. Notice they don't have to get up. Mayhem does not all of a sudden ensue. It's not as if all of a sudden chaos has broken <coughs> loose. But there's a physical element to this. So you're telling a story in your native language and you're watching the students as they gesture the story being told. There's a tip for you. Okay, that often can work really, really well when you're at the telling stage. Anybody know what a gist is? Mm -hmm. All right, can somebody describe? Outline. It's like you hint to the main idea. Good. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, so you're looking for the basic idea behind the story. And here's an example. Maybe you saw me using this earlier. After telling the students the story, you can say, I'd like for you in the next 30 seconds to whisper the gist to a neighbor. And the students pair up, and they simply whisper what they think the basic idea of the story is, what a good summary of the story might be. How about acting it out? 
I mean, like actually setting up a makeshift stage and having students act out the story. I have colleagues, I have friends, I have lots and lots of examples in my own teaching of where we've established a scene, we've set up a stage, like the kitchen and the, here's, the, here's the bedroom, right? And here's the whole house through here, there's the door to leave the house, and we act these sorts of stories out. Uh, Dr. Asher, my publisher, the originator of TPR, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s, was setting up in a community learning kind of an approach, placards and big refrigerator boxes as stages, where, for instance, a big refrigerator box represented a closet. And they would have a bunch of these things tucked into the side of the room, and when it was necessary to pull out a scene, they would set up a stage. And in a room even this size, it would be very possible to get a large box and use it as a specific stage prop and have students act out the story. Uh, my middle schoolers go crazy over any stories that have guns in it. So we use squirt guns. Uh, my middle schoolers love animal stories. Some of them act out the animals as if they're the animals. I've had rubber dog snouts where they'll strap them to their face. Uh, or you could just have them act out, you know, being a bunny rabbit or something like that. And animals, of course, are another common element in any culture. And so it's a way in which you can engage the student by having them act out that, that story. I've had students want to be doors. They've begged me to be tables. <laughs> Please, I just want to be involved. I want to act this out. And so we've had students get down on their knees and be a table, their back's to the table. <coughs> Another that comes up and places food on their back, and others that go like this to be the door. <laughs> this to be the door. I had a student one time years back. I couldn't think of anything she could be in our story. And she said, I'll be the clock. <laughs> I said, wonderful. You can be the clock. Perfect. We had five or six people acting this scene out. She stood over on the side, and she was 9.30. <laughs> After about 20 seconds of standing like this, she started going. <laughs> so it's funny to get the kids involved, but they, they want to be involved. The students want to be engaged. As much as they might give you this look like they're too cool for school, they want to be involved. They don't want to be in front of a device hour after hour after hour. It's just not in our makeup. So I encourage you to have them act it out. Any questions on the second step? Yeah, I have a question. In my class, I think acting is really worse. But sometimes, you know, little, little children just want to see what they behavior, what they actions, is, but they not focus on the language. So how do you deal with this problem? Okay, that's, yeah, that, that's definitely an issue. You'll have some students who would rather be spectators, not players, and that's fine. Because again, we're not trying to perform surgery here, right? This isn't a life or death task that, that we've been charged with. This is a community type effort of teaching language and culture. And if the student is at least engaged in the process, but chooses not to be an active participant as an actor, they're still going to be learning the language. So it isn't always necessary to, in effect, force them to take that, that active role. If they wish to be the spectators, as long as they're engaged, as long as they're paying attention to the eye, they are going to move in the direction of O. It, 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 it can't happen any other way. As long as they're attending to the meaning of your eye, they'll move toward O. I don't know if that answered your question, but is that good? Okay. My question is related to the part of culturality. Uh, just now you say you uh, sometimes you will, will divide the whole class into several groups. But um, it is possible that there will be some students who are not so creative. So maybe they do not want they, they, they do not have the ability to create a, a story 
or participate in the creation. Mm, but when he or she sees so many students are participating, mm, so she will feel frustrated or depressed. It's just like uh, at the beginning of the class when you ask us to perform the, the stage, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a